You're not the only, we're all the same, in need of mercy, to be forgiven and be free. It's all you've got to lean on, but thank God it's all you need. Stay up here. And Christina, you were in the choir. You need to be up here too. Because we're going to have them help us with one more song. Yeah, oh, is it? We have Poochers here too. Oh, we need all the Poochers we can get. Okay, all right. So I'm going to relate a little story because only the people who were in choir know this story. Um, and it happened kind of spontaneously a couple years ago, maybe three years ago. So let me set the stage. The sanctuary is filled with people waiting for the performance. And the curtains are closed, and what, you, what people out here don't see is the choir is already up in the choir loft, and we're standing there looking at this curtain, and we can kind of hear muffled sounds, what's going on back here. But the sound guys, of a couple, three years ago, started piping this song in, and it's the song leading right up to the performance, and we just started singing along with it, and it's one of the most inspirational parts, I, I think, of the whole thing, is the choir singing as loud as they can, and nobody out here in front has any idea that we're even doing it. So, um, good, it was uh, just a neat part. So I want everyone to sing this song. Let me get myself prepared here. <laughs> Oh, 
But you have to stay standing because you still have to sing more. <laughs> and the rest of you, too. That was so excellent. How fun. Greater is the one living inside of me than he 
sing this song together. The coming a day. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come. No more clouds in the sky. No more tears to dim the eye. All is peace. Thank you for the price you paid, bearing all my sin and shame. In love you came and gave amazing grace. Thank you for this love, Lord. Thank you for the
seated please <clears throat> I'd like to repeat a line from that song that has really really hit me and it is wash me in your cleansing flow now all I know your forgiveness and embrace how many of you want to know that forgiveness and embrace you don't have to raise your hands but if you want to raise your hands go for it how many of you want to know that forgiveness and, em and embrace amen we're, we've been reading, and uh, pastor, the other pastors and I, we've been reading through the book of John and getting ready for this series that we started last night. And something that I've noticed, and I shared a little bit last night, is that Jesus meets each person that he heals a little bit differently than he met the previous one. Sometimes he just tells the person to get up. Sometimes he touches them. Sometimes he tells someone else, your son, your son will be well. Sometimes he mixes mud on the ground and puts it on them. And he has different ways to meet the needs of these people. And I want to invite you to accept that, that what's worked for someone else may be not the exact way that God works for you. We're all in different places in our lives. And... We all have something unique, and Jesus and God can work to meet you where you are. And I've heard it said, God loves us so much, or God, God will meet you where you are, but he loves you too much to leave you there. So now, whether you come down here, or whether you would like to stay in your seat, or whether you'd like to stand or kneel, wherever you want to be now, I invite you to be there because I know God can reach you there. If you would like to come down, if you would like to stay where you are, if you would like to kneel, if you would like to stand, I believe God will reach wherever you are. And he will, and he has the power to transform you there and to bring you to somewhere new. So if you please bow your heads with me in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much for your promises and your word, for your promise to heal, to be present, and to restore joy in our lives. Each one of us has something on our hearts. There may be many joys on our hearts. We praise you for those. There may be sorrows on our hearts. And maybe right now, we just don't want to praise you for those. I just pray that we would be able to trust those in your hands. That we would listen to your voice, whether it's still and small or it's loud, roaring like a lion. May we listen. May we give our lives to you. Bless those who are hurting right now. Draw close to them. Make them feel your presence. 
May we be an open-armed, open community church where people can feel welcome, feel loved, feel accepted, feel cared for, and feel your presence. I pray now that you would bless those who have joys in their lives, that they may give you the glory and in each day express gratitude to you, to those around us. May we all see you in new ways each day in our lives. Those who are sick, those who are injured, those who are physically hurting, I pray that you would bless them. I pray that you would heal them. Those who aren't here with us today, for whatever reason, I pray that you would draw close to them, uh, that they would know that they're loved by you, by us. For the requests that haven't been shared, I pray that you would give us the courage and the trust to give those to you. And all the other things that have been mentioned, but I don't remember, I pray that you would hear those prayers now. And in this time now, I'd like to invite each person to spend a moment in prayer. Thank you for hearing our prayers this morning. May we continue to speak to you, to listen to you. I ask now that you bless Joel as he is going to be speaking from your word. I pray that you speak through him. The words that you have given him, you would continue to bless those. And that we would be open to the working of your Holy Spirit through those words or through other, uh, other methods that you have for us and that we maybe aren't aware of, that we'd be open to those. May we listen to you, may we hear you, and may we follow you. All of this we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. morning. Wow. It's exciting. It's exciting that we get to open the Word of God, and we get to share, and we get to talk, and we get to think about this together as a group, collectively. And, and Pastor Jim asked me to talk about uh, Acts chapter 1, the preparation and, and the, the marching order. So Jesus has been risen from the dead. He comes out. He's hanging out with his disciples. And they get to ask him, hey, what's really going on? And he gets to open the scriptures, starting with Moses, all the way up through the prophets and, and the Psalms. And he gets to open it up to the people. And they get to say, wow, we had this all wrong. That's so much better than what we had imagined. And they were constantly united. They decided they were going to be together. And, and it culminates here in Acts chapter 2, which uh, Pastor just going to uh, nail on next week. Uh, is this, this holiday called Shavuot, and it's Pentecost. We call it Pentecost. It's a counting uh, to 50. How many of you can count to 50? Okay, so we're going to do a little practice here. So we get our grain, and so we start the day after uh, Passover starts. So the blood has been smeared on the doorposts, and the angel passes over. And the firstborn of all the homes that didn't have that blood die. 
but we're spared because we have the blood of Jesus promised to us. And so they take the grain, and so uh, they take it, and they say, okay, this is the first day. And then they go, okay, this is the second day. And they count to 50, and on the 50th day is this special holiday where they have all this celebration because they finally have some of the goods. They have some of their cucumbers. They have some of their garlic. They have some of their lentils. They have their grain. They have all these flowers. This is beautiful. They have a celebration. And they can celebrate, wow, the Lord, you are the completeness. You have everything necessary for us. Now, um, <clears throat> if you were with the ancient Hebrews, and, and I just think, ah, just letting you into my world a little bit. If I could be at any two places, if I could choose two places to be biblically, and I get to hang out there for the whole biblical encounter, it would be the Exodus up through Sinai, and it would be uh, that, pa that Passion Week up through Pentecost. Just incredible shadow and fulfillment. Jesus, the lamb, paying the price, the lamb covering the foreshadow. Just, just bring so much life and, and, and depth and, and joy to it all and, and just the glory of it all. And so they leave and, and they had this huge miraculous experience and they cross the Red Sea and the Egyptians are completely demolished. There's no way this superpower has any authority or any power anymore to come after them. They don't have to worry anymore that their former bondage can catch up to them unless they create it themselves. But the superpower no longer is powerful enough to reach out into the desert and capture and enslave them once again. And that's the same way with the cross, isn't it? So fully demolishing Satan's concepts of grabbing and holding. You are free and free indeed. You are free and free indeed. So we have this opportunity to think about this holiday as, it, as the shadow and, and as the, the fulfillment. So if we could kind of think about the cycle. So first God says, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the shadow, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the fulfillment. Okay? So God says to Moses, I see my people in bondage. God recognizes our need, the depths of where we are, and he doesn't leave us there. It starts with God. The core of who he is recognizes and sees the depths of where we are. And then he reveals himself at the bush. He says to Moses, take off your sandals. This is holy ground. He says to Moses, I am that I am. I'm so powerful, I cannot be contained. If there was a giant power switch in outer space that you could somehow mysteriously turn off, all the suns, all the planets, all life would cease to exist but God. This self-existent God who does not require any external, anything giving to him to have life. He is life. And his deep love. I want to, I hear their cry. I want to do something about this. So he reveals who he is, and Moses has to struggle with that. And finally, through that, he, get, he gets to go down there, and uh, ten plagues later, they're out, and they're on their way. All right? So, um, so we see God's revealing who he is through the Passover and the Exodus. He's revealing who he is at the Sinai Desert and the mountain. He's revealing to the people who he is. When he asks them, prepare yourselves. I want you to, to, to take a bath. I want you to cleanse yourself. I want you to wash all your clothes for two days. You get two days to get ready. On the third day, you come up to the mountain. They have the ropes. You can't get too close. I'm going to speak to you through the cloud, through the thundering, through the lightning. I'm going to reveal myself, who I am, and part of who I am is this marriage covenant I want to make with you. We're going to call it the Ten Commandments, okay? It's a marriage relationship that I want to make with you, and I want to be madly head over heels in love with you, and I want you to grow into being mad head over heels in love with me. And so he says this, this idea of Torah. It's not law in the sense of do this, 
don't do that. I mean, can you imagine if you were in a relationship and somebody had to say to you, now, gentlemen, this is the anniversary. Don't go to the football game. You need to spend time with your wife. Okay, check. I'm here. Happy anniversary. <laughs> I did it. What? You're kidding me? That's not love. So this idea of Torah, it's teaching, it's instruction, it's, it's life. It's story. It's, it's laws. It's, it's lessons learned from other people's buffoonery. Right? So this idea of Torah is much bigger and grander and more amazing than just confining it to laws and 613 rules of do's and don'ts. So it's more than that. And so then they're there at the at this mountain of God. And God comes down and he's present closer to these people than they have ever experienced before in their lives. They just experienced God laying the smack down and all these idols beat up the river God. Beat up the, the dust god. Beat up the cow god. Beat them all up. What? Bring it. Right? God just smacked them down. And now here they are after going through the Red Sea, after the drowning of the Egyptians, and they're there, and there's this earthquake, and there's trumpet blasting, and there's lightnings, and it's scary. Oh, God, you're so big. And God talks to Moses, and he says, look, this is what I want. If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, keep that relationship, then you will be a special treasure to me. I tell people over and over and over again, whoever I can get to listen, how amazing it is, gentlemen, listen, how amazing it is to be married to a woman you are more in love with after 15, 20, 30 years than the day you first met her. How awesome is that? To be more impressed with her character after being with her for that long. And that's what God wants. God wants that beauty to be bubbling up inside and to say, wow, you knocked my socks off. Woman! That's what God says. You will be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. You're going to be an example for the whole world. You're going to go out there and you're going to be something that's going to just revolutionize. This planet's not going to know what hit them. They're going to be like, what? And these are the words that you shall speak to the children. So this is God's call, and so he's revealing himself to them. And there's these thunderings and these lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain. And there's a sound of the trumpet. And it's so very loud. It's not a quiet experience. It's not a let's go sing kumbaya in the forest and have a little bit of alone time now. This is loud, and it's collective, and they're together. And it's so loud that all the people in the camp trembled. They trembled. God, that's more than I expected. That's, that's bigger and grander than I could ever dream. And, and I don't know what to do with that. A picture of who you are. How can I deal with this picture of who you are? And they said to Moses, go talk to him for us. This is a little bit scary. Go talk to him for us. And you tell us, and we're going to obey. We don't want to die. I'm too young to die. Go talk to him for us. Oh, so the people stood afar off, but Moses, the people stood afar off, but Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. Can't explain it can't define it, can't put it in a box. It's scary. God is a scary being. He's huge to think that I can com com confine him or to put him in a position or a box or, or some kind of a capsule where I can be comfortable with him is insane. 
I cannot be comfortable with this God because he's insanely, amazingly huge. Well, I'm so teeny tiny little. But Moses was willing to engage with the darkness, with the unknown, with the unseen, with the confusion, with the cognitive dissonance, with the not able to define or to understand or to, okay, well, I'll go anyways. I'll go anyways. So he goes up there and he interacts with this God and all the people had said, well, we're going to do whatever you say. <sighs> but often, as the human experience is, is, we feel like God takes a little bit longer than we had anticipated. Isn't that true? God, you promised. Why are you slow? So they go to Aaron and they say, look, Moses, Take a long time. So the people go to Moses, and they, they go to Aaron, and they say, come, make us gods that, we can, that can go before us. Yeah, they go to the next one. That one. Uh, for this Moses, I don't know what happened to him. Maybe he's dead, maybe he's alive, maybe he ran off. You know, maybe he found his sheep, and he's, like, going to take care of them for a while. I don't know. Okay? We don't know what's going on with him. But for us, we need something. We need something. He brought us up out of Egypt. We don't know what has become of them. Okay, so Aaron's like, ah, okay, so he, he gets, they, they break off their, their jewelry and they put it together and, and he uses his tool and he makes this golden calf and he says to the people, check this out, he says to the people, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. But isn't that, it's, it's easy to, to say, that. But isn't that sometimes what we do? We get into these arguments one with another because I have this box for God and your box is shaped differently. I've confined God into my understanding and my experience in this direction, in this place. Or maybe there's other pieces or other, other aspects of life that are pulling on me. And, and somehow this, this concept of, of this calf God in Egypt, somehow they related it with with the true God, who, and they're, they're claiming this is the God who laid the smack down on all the other gods. This is the same one. So they're taking their concept of their experience that was valid and true and authentic, and they're morphing it into something that they can be comfortable with. They're morphing it into something that they can define. They're morphing it into something that's comfortable. God, you gotta be comfortable. That was too scary. This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. So that was that experience. Moses comes down. He breaks the tablets. 3,000 people, about. So about 3,000 people were slain that day. That should trigger in your mind Acts chapter 2. About 3,000 people lived that day. This was on the 50th day after Pentecost. Acts, Pentecost, 50 days after the crucifixion. The law of God, his character, that relationship was written on stone. Acts, the promise is that it's written in our hearts. It's no longer external out there. God writes it with his finger in Exodus. In Acts, the Spirit of God is poured out in such a way where the character of God is written on the heart of human beings. And they were both at mountains. You have Mount Sinai and Mount Zion. So that brings us to Acts. So you have this picture of these people and their response, their uncomfortableness with the revelation of who God is. And now the disciples get a little bit of a different chance. There's going to be some parallels here. Okay, So being assembled together, they... Uh, he commanded, Jesus commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. You have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized by the Holy Spirit not many days from now. What a promise. They're getting up to it. He's with them for 40 days, and he's giving them this promise again and again and again. You think back to John, John 14, 15, again and again and again, the promise of the Helper. Your mind should go back to, to the book of Jeremiah 31. Your mind should go back to the book of Joel. 
these promises of the gift. You think of Ezekiel, take out the heart of stone and put in the heart of flesh. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? They both just had incredible experiences of who God is at Passover. They both just experienced some amazing things, and they both have a certain image, don't they? The disciples, it must have been so deeply ingrained in their, their societal DNA of this conquering Messiah to beat the snot out of those Romans. Come on now. That had to be so deeply part of who they were that again, Jesus is about to go to heaven. He just, was, he just died. He rose from the grave, the conquering Savior. He keeps showing himself to them. Touch my hand, touch my side. This is insanely awesome. Okay, now it's time to get to the good stuff. Let's get the swords. No! Ugh. No! They're trying to force him into something he's not going for. The Israelites tried to force God into this image of gold, and even these disciples, again, really? Really? That's not my plan now, boys. That's not where we're going. We have this image of God, and they both were trying to struggle with creating the reality within which they had to live. Are we going to form a fashion of gold? No, because that's evil. But we're going to get our swords and our shields and our helmets and do that then. They're still creating an image of God that doesn't fit reality of who he is. They would not allow, or they're trying to struggle with, coming into grips with a God who's bigger or broader or more amazing or more powerful than they had imagined. They were not comfortable with the direction things were headed. And so again, the question, now, hey, is this the time now? Yes, I love a good action flick. <laughs> right? It is not for you to know times and seasons, Jesus says, which the Father has put in his own authority. It's not for you. Keep struggling with me, okay? But you shall receive power. This is going to be different. We're going to transform your motives. We're going to transform your dreams. Last week, Pastor Jim talked about our dreams and how they were dashed upon the, the, the base of the cross. And, and, and it's just, we, we're expecting this, and it's not that way at all. And God says, I want to dream something bigger. I want to dream something grander. I want to dream something more amazing to the core of who you are than you could ever have even anticipated. Don't do that. Stay with me. Whereas, whereas so many of the ancients said, you go talk to him for us, Jesus said, no, you stay with me. Wrestle with me in the darkness. Wrestle with me in the unknown. Wrestle with me when it seems like it's not going the way it's supposed to go. Stay with me. Don't run off. Don't be afraid. Don't tremble. This same God wants to reveal himself in such an earth-shattering, shaking, powerful way again. But don't run away. Don't run away. Practice being there now. Practice being there now. I love you so much. I'm madly head over heels, crazy in love with you. Don't run away. Be with me. Be with me in the dark. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses. That's what he wanted before, wasn't it? In, in Exodus 19, he said, you will be my priest. You will be a special treasure to me. And Jesus is saying, again, he's mirroring the commandment to Moses. All these hundreds of years later, you will be my witnesses. He wanted you to be priests. He wanted you to be a special nation. It didn't pan out the way his heart desired it to be. And he says again, stay with me. Be in the darkness with me. Wrestle with me. Give up your own dreams and your own passions, your own desires to be with me. Don't go away. 
You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and then in Judea and Samaria, and then to the end of the world. Stay with me. I want to create something beautiful in you. I want to, I want to infuse you with a new heart, with new passions, new desires. I want to give for you something more than you've ever experienced. I want to recreate in you what I desired from the beginning. And what is the empowerment? What is it that forces? Because when we separate ourselves from that struggle, when we separate ourselves from that darkness where God is, what drives us is the whip. Got to do this, check, flowers. Got to do this, a card, check. Got that one. Got to do this, make the bed, check. Did that last week. And but that leads to keeping records, doesn't it? But you didn't do, and you didn't, and, and you didn't. And that's where we see the falter, the, the falling. And so it goes back to my original hypothesis that, that it starts with God noticing where we are. And then it starts with, then the next step is God revealing the core of who he is in some way. And then offering a chance for us to respond. And then a God noticing where we are. And then a God who reveals a core piece of who he is and giving us a chance to respond. And then a God noticing where we are and revealing who he is and giving us a chance to respond. I want to infuse you with power. And not the power to, to, to cause crazy things to happen. Crazy healings or, or, or crazy jumpings across Grand Canyons or, or crazy walking on waters. That stuff's cool and amazing, but that's not the core of what I desire for you. I desire for you a heart, a heart that is infused, infused with my character, with who I am. That you would want the things that I would want and, and that I would want the things that you would want and, and that when you pray in my name that your heart and my heart are fused together. And so I have the, um, the message on the left and, and, and the New King James on the right, and, and the, they agreed that they were in this for good. They met together. They got together. They were in that room, the 120, the men and the women and, and Mary and Jesus' brothers, and they're all there, and they agreed that they were in this for good. We're not going to run away. We're not going to go seek something more comfortable. We're not going to go and hang out in a place that is more appealing or, 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 or more palatable. They agreed they were in this for good completely together. Wasn't well, this what we want? Isn't this what we desire? To be in this completely together, to wrestle with God in the darkness together. As a family, completely united completely united. New King James says these all continued with one purpose or mind in prayer. And they were seeking this together. Jesus went to heaven. Ten days they decided we are committed to this. We are committed to being in this completely together. This isn't an individual thing. A lot of times, uh, the Christian world, we have this very individualistic, it's between you and God. But I believe in this sense, there's a step up. There's an invitation for you to come into something collectively. The explosion of the Christian church was not because of one individual. It was because of a collective desire to be completely in this together, not because there was anything in and of themselves, but because they said, we will surrender. We see who you are. We're not comfortable with it. It doesn't make us feel like we understand who you are because our whole worldview is flipped upside down and it will continue to be flipped upside down. But I'm committed to being here with you. And they all said that. Yes, we will. So, the 50th day, instead of being written on stone tablets, they are written on their hearts. 
instead of being written by the finger of God because of the pushback, because of the fear, it's written by the Spirit of God in 3,000, 3,000 in one day. It's a reversal. Instead of 3,000 being dead, now there's 3,000 who are living. Because the people were willing to wrestle with God in the darkness. Jeremiah 31, 33. I will put my law, my character, who I am, in your minds and write it on your hearts. And I will be your God and you will be my people. The invitation in Acts 1 is to wrestle with a huge God who's bigger and and more scary than what we would like to think. The invitation is to set down the baggage of how he has to act, how he has to behave, how he has to fit into my worldview. The invitation is to allow God to be as big and as grand and as amazing as he is, and I can stand without perishing, without being consumed. The promise is a new character, a new heart, a new desire in me because of him. The binding up of the broken, the healing of the torn, the completeness of the damaged. His presence in me, Joel chapter 2, 28. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Because I'm making you complete, because I am fulfilling my promise to write my character, the core of who I am, inside of you. Don't, church, don't run away. Don't, don't be afeared of this God who is larger and bigger and grander than than we give him credit, than we allow him to be. The, The bounty sometimes pulls us away, and the bounty sometimes says, you have enough. It's okay. Be content. Dream about the quads you need. Dream about the truck you need. Dream about the boat you need. You're okay. But God's saying, come to me, come to me, come to me collectively. Collectively and be decided that you will be committed through the end. That this God who is too big and too scary and too holy and too compassionate, that it blows our mind how compassionate and he sees the depths of the people in pain and, and he sees the power holding a son. Look at that. The son, holding the son in those hands. And that the one on the bottom, right, I don't know if you can really recognize it, but it's, it's Moses and his sandals are off in the foreground. He's a, he's a wise God. He's a holy God. There, there's so much to him. There's so much to him that we cannot say, it's okay, we can put him here, and God, you have to act this way. We have to give him space. We have to give him space to say, you're big enough, you're grand enough, you're massive enough to do what you need to do, and I'm going to be choosing to trust you, not knowing, in fear, not knowing what's happening, because you are a mighty God, you are a powerful God, you are a loving God, and you are a compassionate God. The invitation, the invitation to make space for God.
Father, you are king over 